So I'm creeping up on 1500 days of using the iPad Pro as my main form of computing. And I say main form because I still use a MacBook Air from time to time, but again, my iPad Pro is my main computer and I use it for everything from video editing to word processing to leisure activities like gaming and watching Netflix and literally everything in between. So in this video, what I wanna do is talk to you guys about how I use my iPad Pro, my workflow, and let you guys know my honest opinion and experience overall and what I've learned about using the iPad Pro as my full-time computer because there is a lot of good that I love about the iPad, otherwise I wouldn't be using it as my main computer, but there's also some things that you should definitely know about when coming to the iPad Pro, and especially if you're thinking about making it your only computer. So without further ado, let's talk about the iPad Pro, the good, the bad, and everything in between. Let's get it. So just a quick backstory on how I use my iPad Pro and how it came to be that I use my iPad Pro as my main computer. So I got a hand-me-down 2015 iPad Pro back in 2017, and at first I just used it pretty much as a big tablet because that's what it was. It was huge, it had a huge bezels, it still had the home button. It was kind of almost uncomfortable to use in the hand as a tablet, but the more and more that I used it for different tasks that were a little bit more than just watching videos on YouTube and on Netflix, I started to realize just how powerful and how quick things render, how quick things export from both a video processing standpoint, but also just from everyday tasks like Microsoft Word, being able to open a Google Doc, things like that. And as I started to do more with the iPad Pro, I started to realize like, wow, this is a very capable machine that's being held back dramatically by its operating system. Because when I got that 2015 iPad Pro, it was still running just a different version of iOS. It still hadn't done that separation into iPad OS 13. And I'm playing some clips right now of my old YouTube channel because I started my YouTube channel talking about the iPad Pro because I just kind of fell in love with it and I didn't see that there was much content out there relating to the iPad Pro, especially in a professional setting. So then came the 2018 iPad Pro. They revamped the whole design of it to make it look just a lot more aesthetic, a lot more industrial. They got rid of the home button. They replaced it with Face ID. They had a uniform bezels throughout. And that is a form factor that we now see across pretty much the entire iPad lineup besides the iPad 9th gen. And when the 2018 iPad Pro first came out, I didn't just jump at it right away because, again, I wasn't using the iPad for more than just kind of side stuff, for hobby stuff, for leisure stuff. So to spend, I think it was $800 at the time for that iPad was still a little bit much for what I was going to use it for. But then I stumbled upon it on Prime Day for a refurbished version, and that is where this story kind of takes off where it's, my iPad Pro, from that day on, I remember I opened that box and then I started to really see what this thing was capable of that was just being held back a little by its software, but from a hardware standpoint, it was leaps and bounds ahead of the competition. From a power and efficiency standpoint, the same thing goes. It was just leaps and bounds ahead of everything else around it, especially even some computers at that same price point. That is how I started my personal YouTube channel and then eventually came onto here because I love the iPad Pro so much, but didn't see much content of how to use it in a professional setting especially. So now let's actually get into what I love about the iPad Pro and what really drew me to it. So the first thing was just the look, the feel, and the versatility of the hardware itself. It was the first time that Apple put a 120 hertz ProMotion display on pretty much any of their devices. And from the moment you use that thing, you were like, wow, this thing is extremely fluid. It's easy to use. Everything is so snappy. The marriage of software and hardware was just perfect, especially for a kind of mobile OS operating system. Now again, this is back when it was iPadOS 13 and they just made the split between iOS and iPadOS. So there were still some learning curves and there were still some software limitations with iPadOS on the iPad Pro, but it was leaps and bounds ahead of what it was with something like iOS 11 or iOS 12, which all it really did was give you like split screen on the larger 2015 iPad Pro. But it was one of those devices where, yes, it was a tablet first and foremost, it was a touch first interface first and foremost, you know, I had the Apple Pencil that I bought immediately when I did get the iPad Pro, and then I had that Slimfolio keyboard. So it went from being a tablet that I would take handwritten notes on, and again, I was in a corporate setting, so I wanted to figure out ways to use my iPad Pro in a world where everybody had IBM ThinkPads and everybody was using Microsoft Office for day-to-day -day tasks. So what I would do was I pulled out one note, I started handwriting my notes, it would kind of sync to my cloud, those notes would then go onto my IBM ThinkPad that I would use, but overall I just loved using it in different form factors in different ways. When I would go into meetings, people would ask me like, how do you use an iPad in a work setting? Like, how are you using Microsoft on the iPad? There wasn't much content and much awareness that the iPad was more powerful than that laptop that that person was using in that meeting sitting across from me. But the iPad Pro slowly but surely became more and more part of my workflow. And then after that, I was using a MacBook Air to edit videos for YouTube on the side and things like that. But then I found an app called LumaFusion. And you guys are probably very familiar with LumaFusion now at this point. But LumaFusion was very new to me back in the day. And the first thing that I noticed when I first made a video on LumaFusion is just how quickly that A12X Bionic chip 
exported that and rendered that video in real time. I was recording in 4K, I was using an external camera, I was using a Sony A5100, so I think it was 1080p, but then also I was recording in 4K with my iPhone, and it was just navigating all that footage so easily and seamlessly, and I was like, wow, this thing is so powerful, and it just keeps getting better and better. And then as the OS evolved, right, we got 13.4 cursor support, Apple released the Magic Keyboard, which then completely changed how you interact with the iPad Pro. So again, one of the best things about the iPad was just its overall versatility. It can be a laptop if you want it to when you need it to be. It's a tablet first and foremost with a touch-first interface. It's a digital notepad when you need it to be. And then when it comes to leisure, it's a great gaming device, right? It connects to all of your Xbox, PlayStation, and MFI-supported controllers. And then also, it's perfect for viewing movies and YouTube videos and everything and the like and in between. So from a versatility standpoint, there is nothing on the market, in my opinion, that matches that portability, that form factor with all these use cases you can throw at it and that it can handle it with such grace and power. And then one last thing I will say about the design and the versatility of it is think about it. We are not coming up on five years of the iPad having that same exact form factor. And I don't see Apple kind of rushing the chains of form factor or the design whatsoever. If anything, the entire lineup has now adopted that design language. And it's because, and in my opinion, they reach kind of the peak form of what the iPad can be. Can they lessen the bezels? Sure. Can they make it a little thinner? Maybe. Can they add more battery? Sure. But the actual essence and the actual form factor and design, I think is going to stay relatively the same. And I don't see Apple really making many changes aside from making some smaller camera bump changes or changing the orientation of the camera. But from a look and feel standpoint, it's going to look a lot like the 2018 iPad Pro for a little while longer. So Paperlike was one of the first iPad accessory companies that I had ever tried. They had been around for years, giving us the best screen protectors that money could buy. But they recently decided to bring their iPad accessory expertise and create a new premium folio case for the iPad Pro and iPad Air. Their new charcoal folio case aims to bring users the look and feel of your favorite notebook, but for your iPad. The quality and materials they decided to use are exceptional. The exterior is made up of this sturdy polyester fabric that is rugged and able to protect your iPad screen, while the interior is made out of a super soft microfiber lining to make sure no scratches come anywhere close to your precious iPad. My favorite part is how it actually connects via magnets instead of having a shell or a case to mount it. All you do is slap your iPad on the magnets to hold it sturdily in place. As you can see, my scientific shake test lets you know just how strong those magnets are. They also decided to include a magnetic oversized closing flap to make sure you can securely fit your Apple Pencil and feel confident it's not going anywhere and it also works with Paperlike's pencil grips. If you're looking for a tri-fold folio case that protects your iPad, can act as a stand and a canvas, is premium and lightweight, you definitely got to give this one a try. Click the first link in the description below to check it out, it really helps support the 9to5Mac channel. So thank you to Paperlike for partnering up with 9to5Mac and now back to the video. Now let's talk about the operating system because yes, this is kind of in the middle. It's a pain point for some people. It's amazing for other people. But the first thing I will talk about is the app store, right? You have millions of apps at your disposal made specifically for iPhones and iPads. So they're optimized for, I guess now the M2 chip, but they are still optimized for the A12X and A12Z and the M1 chip. They work extremely fast. They're nimble, they're quick. You can go from editing a video in LumaFusion to editing a thumbnail in Affinity Photo to going into Photoshop to using iMovie to going into CapCut to going through all these creative applications and then quickly switching to the Microsoft suite of products, which even those applications have seen a crazy improvement in usability and form factor and being able to actually give you the same one-to-one -one experience you would see on a Windows desktop. So the iPad software experience in the App Store is what really sets it apart from anybody else in this space. So what I always tell people if they are looking to go to the iPad Pro as their full-time computer is, A, make sure that you have the applications you need ready to go, and then B, just be ready to go from point A to point B in a different way than you would with a traditional OS like Mac OS or Windows, right? You can, for the most part, get from point A to point B, there's just a little bit of a learning curve that you need to find out to actually get your workflow down. So I figured out my workflow because I, I was persistent with it and I wanted to use the iPad as my main computer because it was just so much more fun to use. But some of the biggest complaints people had were the limitations of that software. And to each their own, yes, there are some limitations. The file manager is still a little bit wonky, right? There was a lot of issues with some apps opening. Multitasking wasn't always great up until stage manager, but even some of the things that people hated on when it came to like things like multitasking, it's something that I looked at as a positive. For instance, my iPad Pro is my workhorse machine. I know that I can't be distracted by a third or fourth or fifth application or window open because I'm stuck on one application, maybe two applications on my 12.9 inch iPad Pro and I'm getting my work done. So whenever I'm editing a video, I'm not distracted by my Discord. I'm not distracted by a YouTube video. I'm not distracted by some other window that's open like ESPN or Bleacher Report. I'm focused on my LumaFusion video or I'm focused on my Affinity Photo thumbnail or that word processing doc or that PowerPoint that I'm working on. So overall, 
The fact that yes, the multitasking isn't perfect and there is a bit of a learning curve actually works in your favor if you're trying to get actual work done. So now let's get into you know, the hard truths of the iPad Pro because like I keep mentioning, there are some software limitations. Yes, the app store is vast and it's huge and there's a lot of apps dedicated for the iPad and that's one of the biggest reasons why the iPad is so successful. Developers don't want to code for a tablet that's not running iOS because there's so many inconsistencies and different variations and varieties and companies come and go and they there's no consistency for them to make money. So why would they spend their time and resources on those app stores when the app store in iOS and iPadOS is consistently improving and is the most constant thing we've had since 2008. But again, when it comes to those software limitations and those OS limitations, things like the Finder app or their, you know, their files application is still a little bit iffy. I don't, there's no real way to describe what makes it not as good as a Finder app on, let's say, something like Mac OS, but you, you kind of feel it. You feel it that it's not perfect yet. The drag and drop maybe isn't as fluid. The, the transfer speeds aren't as good. The, the ability to kind of reorganize things in a quick manner, it just, it isn't, there's something off about it that's hard to pinpoint. And if you're an iPad Pro user, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but it's hard to describe exactly what's wrong with it. Some people are used to it. Like I'm for the most part used to it, but I still prefer the Finder application on Mac OS than I do the Files app on iPad OS. And then when it comes to getting just day-to-day -day work done, sometimes if you haven't actually gone through your learning curve, you're still trying to figure out the iPad Pro, it's gonna take you a little longer to get from point A to point B that I keep mentioning. You will get there eventually. You might need to take a couple of detours to get there, but you will be able to get to that point B. It just might take you a little longer. And that's one of the downfalls of the iPad. You have to really wanna use the iPad as your main computer to really kind of justify it, to really add it to your workflow and to really maximize the efficiencies that you get on the other end. And then some other gripes that I have about the OS itself, because again, this is gonna be very OS focused. The hardware of the iPad Pro is absolutely magnificent. There's really nothing else like it, but when it comes to the operating system and those limitations, the evolution of the iPad, even though it has been slowly coming, that's the key word. It's been so slow. Apple has been very constrained on how, what they wanna do with iPad OS, how they wanna present it, how they wanna do things differently than they would on Mac OS. Like they don't wanna just port Mac OS Sonoma on the iPad because then it wouldn't be an iPad anymore. It would be like a Surface. It would be a Windows Surface that you can just kinda of, sorta of flip into a tablet. Apple's focused on making the iPad a tablet first solution and then if it can do some Mac OS y things and you know, it's just a cherry on top. But some specific nitpicky things that I have, even at the iPadOS 17 level, we did finally add the support for an external webcam, even though it's only for FaceTime right now, but it is coming to other video conferencing apps, but is being able to have maybe two YouTube videos or two audio sources coming out at once. Like sometimes people like to have a YouTube video open and their Apple Music playing at the same time, or at least have the option to do that this is not capable of doing it. The ability to decide where your audio is coming from, right? If you connect to an external display, it's going to default to the external display speakers, even if that external display doesn't have any built-in speakers. So you cannot use your amazing quad speaker system that's built into the iPad Pro, which is already better than most built-in speaker systems in any monitor. From a recommendation standpoint, when people come to me and say, hey, Fernando, I'm going to college. Hey, Fernando, I'm starting my first job. What do I get? Do I go and get a MacBook Air? Do I get a MacBook Pro? Or do I go get an iPad? Do I go use an iPad Pro as my main computer? I, for the most part, still recommend people go get a MacBook Air. Why? Because even the M1 MacBook Air, which is I think currently on sale for $750 on Amazon, if you find it at that price, it's kind of a no-brainer, right? It runs the latest version of Mac OS. Obviously, it's got a built-in keyboard and mouse already built in there. It's running the M1 chip. It has eight gigs of RAM, 256 gigs of storage for $750. It's really hard for me not to recommend that computer to somebody, especially if they only have one choice. I don't want to tell people to go iPad Pro, then they end up not liking that experience and then kind of be regretful that they got the iPad Pro. So for you to get the same experience on the iPad Pro, if you get an M2 iPad Pro baseline, you're still only getting 128 gigs of storage, you are getting eight gigs of RAM, but it's $1,100 and that's just for the tablet. You gotta spend 130 on the pencil, you have to spend 350 on the Magic Keyboard. Yes, sometimes they're on sale, but not by much. So you're spending, what, $1,500 compared to half of that? You can get two M1 MacBook Airs for that price. Sometimes it's a hard recommendation to tell people like, hey, get the iPad Pro because it's so versatile, even though it's gonna take you a little longer to learn how to use it. And that is my biggest gripe with the iPad Pro. It comes down to OS limitations and OS kind of workarounds, and then also the price to performance ratio. M1 MacBook Air, or even the M2 MacBook Air, at $1,000, even that's a great price point compared to an iPad Pro. So I just wanted to give my two cents on the iPad Pro to let you guys know what it was like, what my experience has been like. Do I regret it? No, I love my iPad Pro and I'm gonna continue to use it as my main computer because I just enjoy working on it more. I enjoy editing on it more. I enjoy interacting with it. It's more fun to use. Like I, I look forward to sitting down and using it versus the MacBook Air. It's such a familiar kind of machine. It's just a tool, it's a computer. It's been around since the freaking 1950s basically. So. I don't get as excited to use my MacBook Air, no matter how cool or how big or whatever the case may be. So 
That is my opinion on the iPad Pro. It's got a lot of good that it has going for it. It's gonna to continue to get better. Like I mentioned, I think the merging of the OSs is coming and that's gonna be into iPad OS, not going to Mac OS, not going to iOS. I think it's all just gonna kind of converge into one come the next five to 10 years. So that is my personal opinion. Leave some comments down below about what you think about the iPad Pro. Could you use it as your main computer? If you have one, how do you use it? Do you use it to supplement your device? Because as a supplemental device, it also is a great device. It's just an expensive supplemental device. That's the biggest key. So for me, all the good outweighs the bad. Like I mentioned, there are limitations, but those are all just growing pains. Apple will eventually give us the final form of iPad OS that we want. And what's that gonna be exactly? I don't really know, but I know it's going to be great to see once it happens, because for right now, I'm really enjoying iPadOS 17 and it's gonna be getting better and better. Stage Manager on iPadOS 17 has this great new flow to it that's going to allow me to maybe recommend the iPad Pro to a lot more people than I did a couple of years ago where Stage Manager was still so buggy, it was still very limited, and it wasn't really the same or the same one-to-one -one experience to Windows on, let's say, a Mac OS computer. But that's gonna do it, everybody. If you made it to the end, leave a little dolphin in the comments down below so I know you made it to the end. I know this is more of kind of an experience video and I wanted to talk about how I use the iPad and what I use it for and why I use the iPad overall. And again, I wanted to be honest about some of the bad. It's not perfect and not everybody should just go run out and get an iPad Pro as their only computer because I still would recommend, like I mentioned, a Mac over an iPad for now. But that is my two cents. Leave some comments down below. Let's discuss exactly what you guys use your iPads for, which iPad you have, why you would get an iPad over a MacBook or vice versa. I'm down to discuss in the comments down below. Don't forget to check out Paperlike and thanks for sponsoring this video. But until next time, I'm Fernando. Click on one of these videos to find out more about iOS, iPadOS, or macOS. And until next time, peace.